everyone and welcome through the Blackthorn Arch, a podcast all about the folk tales, fairy stories and ghostly encounters of the UK. My name is Hearth, spelt H-E-A-R-T-H, and today we are going to be talking about a very sad period in Scottish history. We're going to be talking about the Pitaweem Witch Trials. Before we get started, I do need to say that this episode is for mature audiences. Sadly, the witch trials are a brutal time in our history, and because of that, this isn't going to be the nicest of stories. If you don't feel comfortable listening to the distressing events of this witch trial, there are going to be other episodes in this series that are not for mature audiences, and that are more suitable if you don't feel comfortable. I completely understand if you want to skip out this episode, and I will look forward to seeing you in the next one. Now, because this event happened so long ago, this began in 1704, the information is a little bit scattered. So over the past few weeks, I've tried my best to condense the information down as much as I can, attempting to pick out the fact from the fabrication. So hopefully I've managed to create a cohesive timeline of events so that we can figure out what happened during this awful time in Scottish history. Our story starts in March 1704, in the scenic fishing village of Pitaweem. Now, Pitaweem is located in the East Nuke of Fife in Scotland, and during this time, it seemed a very pleasant, community-focused village. However, the community-focused, peaceful village would change drastically when the tall tales of a young 16-year-old boy would accuse many of practicing witchcraft and lead to the deaths of two of the accused. In early March 1704, Beatrix Lang visited the young 16-year-old Patrick Morton while he was working in his father's blacksmith shop. She asked if he would be able to make her some nails. Patrick refused, as he was working on an urgent job in the harbour and couldn't complete her order that day. Beatrix Lang, frustrated that her order would not be completed that day, stormed off, threatening retribution for the actions of the young boy. He didn't take it to heart, however. Many of the locals were quite highly strung, so he went about his day-to-day life as though nothing had happened. However, the next morning, when passing Beatrix Lang's house, he noticed a bucket of water outside, and inside it were burning coals. He immediately became panicked, fearing that Beatrix Lang had cast witchcraft upon him, as it was very common during this time period for a bucket of water and coals to be seen as the tools used in casting spells upon others. In his distress, he went to the village, explaining what he had seen, and very quickly the villagers began to question whether perhaps there was something unusual going on. In the coming weeks, his health began to deteriorate. He began losing his appetite, his breathing became laboured, and he began having fits. When it was found that there was no medical cause for his ailment, the locals began to believe that the devil might be at work. At this point, the local minister stepped in. His name was Patrick Cowper, and he was very well versed in witchcraft during this time period, and he was very intolerant of it. During this time, rumours were spreading from village to village. There had been other witch trials recently in local areas, Fear and fear-mongering of witchcraft were commonplace. And not only did the minister believe that the devil was involved, but he believed witchcraft was involved as well. Several months had passed, and the young boy's condition still hadn't improved. Hearing of this, the minister visited him at home, asking him what had happened, what had caused this, who had caused this. After some pushing, the young boy gave up a name, Beatrix Lang. Alongside Beatrix Lang, the young boy began giving other names, likely with the influence of the minister. He also named Isabel Adam, Janet Cornfoot, Nicholas Lawson, and Lily Wallace as accomplices to the witchcraft cast upon him by Beatrix Lang. More pushing by the minister led to the name of the final accomplice, Janice Horsborough. Now, it's unknown whether the young boy actually knew of these individuals beforehand, but the influence of the minister certainly added them into this case, and ultimately led to what happened in this case. Sadly for those accused, and conveniently for the minister, the villagers had good reason not to believe their innocence. During this time period, witch trials were seen as a convenient way of removing problematic people from the community, 
These were often those who held differing religious or political beliefs, those who held power, property and status within the community, primarily women, usually those without husbands or who had been widowed. The witch trials were a very easy and effective way of removing these people from status, and for those found guilty of witchcraft, their property and money were often added back into the village, ultimately giving people good reason for wanting the witch trials to continue, and continuing to accuse those in positions of power and status. Janet Cornfoot had a reputation within the village. She was well known for threatening anyone that she disagreed with, and it was believed among many that she was a spellcaster. Janet Horsburgh didn't have it much easier. Her husband was a seaman, which seems insignificant enough, however he had also been a local magistrate, giving her some power, status and money within the community. Lastly, Beatrix Lang was married to a tailor, who also happened to be the village treasurer, giving them the influence, power and money to live a relatively comfortable life for the time period. Alongside this, Beatrix Lang had also been accused of witchcraft before, and actually stood trial for charms in 1696, giving the village a reason to doubt her innocence even further. Alongside people with power, influence and money, during this time, particularly in Fife, Scotland, poor women, often those who were widowed and outsiders to the community, were also accused of witchcraft, likely because they fit the stereotype during the witch trial period, of who a witch should be, and so many of the others were likely accused of witchcraft simply because their appearance or status aligned very closely to what the villagers assumed a witch would look like. After the conversation with the young boy, where he had given the names of the witch and her accomplices, those accused of witchcraft were imprisoned in the Toll House, where they went through day after day of torture and torment, as they attempted to get a confession out of each and every one of them. Those who made it out of this experience alive say that they were tortured and beaten, starved and sleep deprived, often being forced to stay awake for five days and five nights, their skin being pricked by sharp objects by a group of drunk men who were positioned outside to stop them from sleeping. The magistrate himself is said to have taken part in these beatings, having beaten Janet Cornfoot with his walking stick. After weeks of unrelenting torture, those accused were led out of the prison and into the young boy's bedroom, their heads covered. The young boy managed to identify each and every one of his attackers, despite not being able to see their faces. After this, Beatrix Lang eventually confessed. She was charged with maleficium. This is known as, quote, an act of witchcraft performed with the intention of causing damage or injury, end quote. She confessed to making spells with buckets of water and coals, as well as stabbing needles into a wax model of her victim. She claimed to have met the devil in the form of a black dog on Sarah's Moor and made a deal with him. Knowing of his shape-shifting abilities, she had witnessed him undertake shape-shifting right before her eyes. Initially, for his assistance, she offered him her daughter, then her granddaughter, who was just six at the time. During her confession, she also named the four others as being her co-conspirators. Soon after, Isabel Adam also confessed, though she took her confession a step further. Not only did she say she had made a deal with the devil, but she'd also been intimate with him, ultimately allowing him to brand her with his mark. She confessed to colluding with the others to kill a local man, the plot only failing when he'd woken from his sleep and made a sign of the cross before them. Her confession added an additional person into the mix, someone who hadn't been named prior to this point, a man named Thomas Brown. Now, Thomas Brown's story is exceptionally sad. After Isabel Adam had named him in her confession, he was dragged from his home and imprisoned, where he was starved and beaten for days and nights on end. Ultimately, he died of starvation in his cell, as was relatively common during this time. The treatment of those accused of witchcraft was horrendous. Often they would be starved of sleep and food in a way to force a confession out of them, and unfortunately for Thomas, he was not strong enough to last with long periods without food and ultimately he died in his cell without ever making trial. 
After his death, confessions were also gained from Janet Cornfoot and Nicholas Lawson. Janet Cornfoot also added that the devil had come to her in her cell, promising her that she would only be locked away for a short period of time if she refused to admit her involvement. However, he did threaten, quote, to tear her to pieces, end quote, should she confess to anything. The four accused who had confessed, Isabel Adam, Janet Cornfoot, Beatrix Lang and Nicholas Lawson were interviewed on the 29th of May, 1704, repeating each of their confessions and confirming their accuracy. Janet Horsborough and Lily Wallace were examined on the 14th of June, 1704. However, they continued to speak their innocence. The Lord Advocate eventually arranging trial for each of those accused to take place in Edinburgh. In September 1704, the young boy was summoned to court in Edinburgh to give trial against those he'd accused, suspiciously having no evidence of an ailment at all. Isabel Adam was questioned before being freed. In November, Beatrix Lang, Nicholas Lawson, Janet Horsborough and Lily Wallace were released after paying a fine of £8 each. However, Janet Cornfoot wasn't so lucky. The magistrate did not believe her testimony, and ultimately she was kept in solitary confinement for further questioning. The guards, taking pity on her, placed her in a cell with a window low enough and large enough for her to sneak out and escape. And escape she did. With one dead already, this story is already incredibly unjust. However, with the escape of Janet Cornfoot, it ultimately sealed her fate with the tragedy that was about to happen. After her escape, Janet Cornfoot made her way to the village of Lucanard, eight miles from Pitt and Weem. There, she asked for help, and she reached out to George Gordon, either by choice or he captured her. During this time, George Gordon was the town minister, and he returned her to Pitt and Weem for the prize of £10. On January 30th, 1705, she was returned to Pitt and Weem, where the villagers quickly heard word of her return. She was initially taken to the house of one of the Baileys. These were the individuals who assisted the minister. But all too quickly, a mob of villagers formed and dragged her from the home. Outside the home, she was tied, beaten, and dragged by her ankles all the way to the harbour. Here, a rope was run from the masthead of a ship all the way to shore. And from this rope, Janet Cornfoot was hung upside down where the villagers proceeded to stone her. Beaten, eventually, she was returned to the ground, where she was further beaten and stoned again. Eventually, the villagers decided that she had had enough punishment, and they were going to finish her off. Placing a door on top of her, they added heavy stones until she was eventually crushed to death. However, the lynch mob wasn't convinced that she was truly gone, and so to finish her off, they brought in a horse and cart to ride over her dead body several times to make sure that she was actually dead. Both Thomas Brown and Janet Cornfoot were denied a Christian burial. Instead, their bodies were thrown into a mass grave known as Witch's Corner. Although we would like to hope that the lynch mob that day was a collection of villagers who'd taken on vigilante justice, that sadly wasn't entirely the case. The mob had the full support of the local minister. Not only did the minister participate, but so did his family members, and high-ranking members of the community also participated in her beating, torture, and murder. And right now, I would love to tell you all that justice was served, that the people who murdered Janet Cornfoot were brought to justice, but sadly, this isn't one of those stories. There was an investigation for murder, where individuals were identified as taking part in the beating, torture, and murder. However, no one of significance was picked out as being part of this attack. Four individuals were primarily identified, these being a schoolboy, two Englishmen, and another individual whose name was never released. These were implicated in the murder, but three of the four fled soon after. After Janet Cornfoot's death, Beatrix Lang did return to Pitt and Weem. She returned in 1705, where she began to speak out about the brutality and mistreatment that she had experienced while she was incarcerated. However, she began to quickly fear that the same thing would happen to her as happened to Janet Cornfoot, 
as no justice had been served. She reached out to the Privy Council for protection. They had granted her this. However, the Borough Council said that it wasn't appropriate, and they claimed that even if they offered her protection, she could still be attacked at night and they would be none the wiser. The Privy Council also ordered further investigations into Janet Cornfoot's murder. However, after the committee failed to attend a meeting on the 9th of May 1705, all other requests for further investigation were ignored. And unfortunately, every single person involved in the beating, torture, and ultimate murder of Janet Cornfoot were let free. Not a single one of them saw a second in the same conditions that they had put these innocent people in. Looking back on the story today, I think it's pretty clear that the young boy, Patrick Morton, didn't act alone. He didn't come up with these names of his own accord. He was pushed and influenced by the minister, the person in power, the person who was meant to help these innocent people, had ultimately given the young boy their names in order to accuse them of witchcraft. Today, we can see the injustice in this, but during this event, Patrick Morton was seen as a saviour, an assistant to the innocent people of Pitt and Weem, for stopping the evil atrocities that these witches were casting upon the local people. Now we can see it for what it is, a man who is purposefully accusing innocent people to gain something from it. And I think that's what makes this case so much more horrific. Not only did two innocent people die, but the person who started it all, the person whose pushing and investigation had offered up so many names, walked free after murder and torture. It's honestly absolutely shocking. And it's one of the many cases throughout history worldwide, but also specifically when it comes to European witch trials, where a child is put forth as the sole witness to witchcraft and ultimately leads to the deaths of several people. Without the involvement of this minister, this would never have happened, and that just makes this all the more sad. So I hope that you did enjoy this episode. This one is a very sad case, and even reading about it broke my heart. We don't hear these stories enough. We hear about the Salem witch trials really frequently. And in the UK, we hear a lot about the Pendle witch trials, but we don't think about the others that occurred during a similar time period. Although this trial occurred at the very end of the witch trial period, it's one of the worst ones I've heard of because so much of this could have been avoided. It was so orchestrated, so purposeful. It could have very easily been avoided, and yet it was allowed to happen. If you did enjoy this episode, I would really appreciate it if you follow or subscribe so that you can be notified for when new episodes come out. If you are on YouTube, feel free to like this video. It really means a lot to me and lets me know that you enjoy these episodes. If you are watching this on YouTube, the podcast is available on audio platforms. And if you are listening to the podcast, this is available in video form on YouTube under the name through the Blackthorn Arch. I hope that you're all staying safe. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your week and hopefully I will get you back through the Blackthorn Arch again next week for another episode.